Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thanks to James and all the other people who put this conference together. These things are always very interesting, very interdisciplinary, and it's very exciting to be part of talking about things that are uh, really important, not at the, uh, the forefront of every, everyone else's minds, but probably will be at the forefront of most people's minds at some point soon. So what I wanted to talk about today was a kind of test to use for figuring out when some object, some organism, some creature, some thing that we are considering would be treated as a rights holder, at least in the legal sense, if not in the moral sense, um, when it would be a person. So he here's the organization of my talk. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the concept of personhood and non-humans for those who heard Professor Singer's speech, you're familiar with this. I'm going to talk about a couple of the problems for recognizing non-human personhood, including problems that are not often talked about. I'm going to talk about the concept of a personhood test, what kind of thing that we could use to determine whether or not something is a person or should be treated as one. Once we have determined whether or not something is a person, I want to talk about what it means to have a personhood, moral, and legal status. I'm going to bring up a problem which often does not get acknowledged, which is a complicating issue for all of these situations, which is the problem of psychological difference. And then I'll sum it up. All right. So philosophers and many ethicists, when they talk about personhood, they are making a kind of point that uh, Dr. Singer talked about and that we're not talking about human beings. We're talking about something that should be treated as a full or at least um, minimal member of the moral community. So whether you are realist about rights or whether you are pragmatist about rights, it is um, the, the kind of thing in which a, uh, a person is someone who or something that will be a, a full member of the moral community and respected and treated as such. Typically, what people have gone back to is that there is some level or some sort of type of cognitive and phenomenal capacity. What sorts of cognitive abilities does uh, an entity have? and what sort of phenomenal experiences that, that allow the entity to have. Can it experience pain or pleasure? Can it experience uh, desire? Those kinds of things. And so, in general, the idea is that what we count among ourselves sort of uncomplicatedly already as a person is about the kinds of cognitive phenomenal capacities that we have. And if other things have those phenomenal and cognitive, as a result of the cognitive capacities, then they merit being treated as persons as well. And so in some cases, it's about determining what those capacities are. Now, these sorts of questions range from the metaphysical to the epistemological to the ethical. The metaphysical questions are, can something besides a human being be a person? Are all human beings person? Uh, can uh, an artificial entity, something that is not organic, be a person? And this is the kind of thing that people in philosophy of mind, uh, psychology, neuroscience, cybernetics will talk about. What kinds of arguments are there to show that we should not rule out from the beginning that non-humans or non-organic creatures could be persons? That's about the question of how could there be non-human persons? The epistemology question is how do we know something? If it is possible that there could be non-human persons, how would we know it? What kind of test would we employ to determine which of the things in the world are and which of the things in the world are not? But a related, but a distinct question is the ethical question, which is how should we treat the objects that we find in the world? There is often the case that something metaphysically may be demonstrated to be possible and yet it's not clear how we would know whether or not we have that sort of object in front of us. And so the ethical question is always about 
what are we going to do with the available knowledge that we have when the available knowledge that we have may not be sufficient to be determinative. Now, what kinds of non-human candidates could there be for persons? Well, we're all familiar with non-human terrestrials, animals. That's what much of this conference will be about. We're familiar with extraterrestrials. I did not put this slide in as a result of what Dr. Singer said last night. It just so happened that this was a, a case. And, and it's interesting in terms of the moral psychology. One of the reasons why E.T. is an iconic example of a non-human person is because they designed him to trigger certain kinds of cognitive effects among human beings. If you're short and you have big eyes and a small mouth and a fuzzy voice, we will love you whether or not you are a human being. Um, E.T. would not have worked if it was a giant mosquito that was cuddly and lovable. Right? Um, there's also artificial life, and this is very similar to artificial intelligence. When we think of artificial intelligence, we often think of computers or programs, something uh, mechanical, non-organic. Artificial life could be an actual um, uh, organic but genetically engineered or otherwise engineered kind of being. So it would still be in, under the general rubric of artificial intelligence. Now, what are some of the problems for recognizing uh, personhood? Well, there are a number of biases that we have. And when I use the term bias, I do not automatically mean that these are somehow immoral or wrong. What I mean is that we are cognitively directed in certain ways to think easily of certain kinds of things as persons, and we are cognitively predisposed in certain ways to not think of things as persons. Sometimes these are relatively hardwired into us. Sometimes these are cultural. So we've got moral and cognitive biases and the, the kinds of ways that we initially categorize things. And we've got two different kinds of issues, which are clearly related, that are connected to the moral and cognitive. We've got the question of how we're going to treat something, but how we identify something. Well, speciesism has already been talked about. So one kind of bias that people have is simply that if something is not human, then we should not think of it as, as a person. There are all kinds of obvious ways in which that is a, a, a faulty way of thinking. Although, just because something is a faulty way of thinking does not mean it's easily gotten rid of simply by realizing that it's a faulty way of thinking. The human brain is very strongly geared toward having in-group, out-group distinctions. And it's the kind of thing that evolved over time for very good reasons. The content of those in-group, out-group distinctions can vary a lot depending on experiences. But when you come to in-group, out-group distinctions based on biological species as opposed to certain types of other human beings, you're dealing with something at a, at a much deeper level. You also have a morphology bias. This is not the same thing as a, a speciesism, but it's related in that there are certain types of body shapes that the human mind is more likely to feel disposed to in terms of recognizing it as a subject, as something with a consciousness. Uh, just as I talked about with E.T., this is why you know, stuffed animals have the big eyes and the, the little mouths and those kinds of things. And there are very few um, stuffed animals that kids like to play with that aren't cute. And cute isn't just culturally determined. Cute is pretty hardwired into us, right? So there are certain kinds of things that we will automatically think of as cute and be more likely to attribute personhood to them. There is also a cultural and legal situation that is likely to be the case in, in a contemporary life that I'm calling prior property status. And that is, particularly when it comes to artificial life and artificial intelligence, it is likely, it's not always the case, but it's likely to be the case that the kinds of beings that we would come across and be conflicted about whether or not they are persons are already owned. Either they have been created by corporations or they've been created in university laboratories that have various kinds of intellectual property uh, regulations. And, and so they are likely to begin their existence as property, as something that is patented or something that is copyrighted or something that is owned. 
And they won't simply be uh, like an extraterrestrial who lands and then we have to deal with it as it is. It will be something that we already have the notion that we own it. So how do we figure out what would be a person and how do we think about you know, trying to move beyond some of these biases? All right, well, there's a famous example in um, uh, philosophy of mind and computer science, cybernetics, in which there was a test for intelligence. Most of you are probably familiar with the Turing test. The basic idea is that if you are, if you are communicating through some sort of medium like a keyboard and a screen with some other entity, and you can ask it whatever you want, and you can't tell the difference between uh, a human and a computer, then the computer has achieved a level of intelligence that makes it equivalent to a human being. Essentially, what is going on here, even though Turing didn't explicitly put it this way, is that this is trying to get around the morphology bias. Right? <clears throat> now, there are well-known problems with the Turing test. It turns out that the Turing test, uh, in terms of those uh, metaphysical and even epistemological questions, isn't very strong. Um, it's, it's more of a test about how easy it is to to trick humans. Uh, there have been lots of computer programs that have passed the Turing test, and there have been lots of human beings who have failed the Turing test. Um, there have, uh, Turing's original example, which is kind of an odd example, he started out with, what if you have a man and a woman in different rooms, and you're talking to them, and you can't tell the difference between the man and the woman. There have also been cases in which you know, someone could not prove they were male or female, and so they failed a gender Turing test. So it, it's, it's possible to, to fail these kinds of tests. Um, and to pass these kinds of tests over on. But let me modify the Turing test with this example because I want to switch from the metaphysical and the epistemological, epistemological to the ethical. What if, in addition to your mouse and your keyboard and your screen, there was a button next to you and after you communicated with these two entities or even the one entity that you couldn't see, you had to decide whether or not to push this button, and the button would flood the room in which that entity existed with very high levels of radiation, and it would destroy it whether it was organic or not. Would that make a difference if there was a kill button? Well, your reaction is probably that it would shift to moral judgment issues over epistemological judgment issues. When you're just having to check yes or no, do I think this is a person or do I not think this is a person, it's not that big a deal. When you have to decide whether or not you will destroy the thing in the other room, you might be more hesitant about your decision, and you might be more worried that you're not very good at detecting these kinds of things. And so if this were the case, we might have a, a lower threshold of how we would uh, treat the, the thing in the other room. Now, one way to think about this because, of course, there are, there are still issues with the Turing test, is to have an even expanded Turing test. So let's take it out of this artificial setting. Um, you can interact with the being. You have to have some sort of non-direct interaction so that you can get over that morphological bias in the first place. But you can ask it any question you want. You can talk about its interests and desires and all those kinds of things. And if in every case it responded in such a way that we would be uncomfortable in destroying it, then it would seem to have passed the test. Now, someone will say, oh, but we can still easily be tricked, and that is true, but we've known for a long time with the other minds problem that I am not able to get into your mind. I cannot tell that any of you whatsoever have any consciousness, any phenomenal experience at all. You might all be automata, you might all be zombies, you might all be any kind of thing, uh, solipsism. I might be the only thinking creature in the world. Well, so why do I not hit the kill button on all of you just for funsies? Well, well, there's an analogy and an, an attribution. For one thing, you have certain kinds of behavior. And although I'm not looking at it right now, I suspect that if I were to look into you, I could see a certain kind of neural structure that would be analogous to mine. So if you're like me in terms of cognitive capacity and you're like me in terms of behavioral response, then I'm going to attribute to you a likeness in terms of phenomenal capacity, what you're experiencing and feeling. We have this evolutionary psychology bias to only attribute these kinds of things in certain ways, and the increasing research in moral psychology shows some very interesting kinds of stuff with this. And I, I, I show the uh, example with Spock when he's mind melding with a non-human creature just to show that uh, we don't have that ability. 
So let's say that we had the expanded Turing test. Well, one way to think about this in terms of error is the morality of error. What side are we going to err on? In the kill button case, you might make a mistake that's a false positive. You might be tricked by a computer program into thinking it's a person. Or you might be uh, tricked into thinking it's not when it is. It turns out that the, in many cases of false positive and false negative, there's asymmetry of error. So if I were to make one kind of error, it's worse than another. It may be safer for me to have a kind of as-if personhood treatment, just as I do in the other minds case. So you can see in this chart, if we're just doing the intelligence Turing test and I get a false positive, well, I've wasted time. If I get a false negative, I've lost an opportunity to, to make use of an intelligent being. With the personhood, eh, if I mistakenly attribute personhood to uh, a non-person, I've wasted time. If I mistakenly say that a person is not a person, then I'm a murderer, uh, an enslaver, and I risk rebellion. That's a big deal. So what happens if something passes this test? Okay. Well, we have certain kinds of expectations for civil rights. If something passes this test, it should be treated in a certain way. We should respect its autonomy. We should um, respect its, its freedom, uh, all based on cognitive capacity. There's a problem, though, in that we assume that if something is a person, it has to be treated like us. Okay? Well, there's assumption of a similar psychology. But what if there's a different psychology? Well, the concept of interest that Dr. Singer talked about last night is important here. It is possible that there be different types of psychologies. It's, po it's possible that something be very much like it, us and that it has self-interest, not just that it's selfish, but it's self-interested. This would be like the, the leopard. Leopards apparently hate everything, including each other. They, they, get, they can stand to be next to each other to mate, and then the rest of the time they stay away. Uh, it's possible to be purely other interested, like a honeypot ant over here. Um, its function is simply to, to feed the others. It probably doesn't want to do anything, but we can imagine an artificial intelligence that's been designed in such a way that it is conscious, but it is only happy if it is serving others. There might be something that has no interest at all, and then there may be something that's so radically different we have a hard time conceiving of it. Well, with, with all of these things, I think that it makes a difference in how we treat it. If something is other interested, we can't respect its autonomy. It doesn't want autonomy. It will only experience joy in life. Its only desire in life is to serve others. If we try to give it freedom and autonomy, we are violating the kind of creature that it is. So just because an AI might be a person doesn't mean we should free it. That might be a horrible, abusive situation for it. The no interest thing is more interesting because it's conceivable that something doesn't care about anything at all. I'm not sure that that kind of thing could actually develop. The last part about the radical difference, radical is a really strong word. We have pseudo-radical -radic differences in that something might have recognizable psychology but have a very different body, like an extraterrestrial. Um, something might have a weird psychology but still be comprehensible to us. This is basically distinct between form and content. I give an example of the Australian redback spider. This is a fascinating little example. The males will often hang their bodies in front of the females and let the females start eating them so that they have time to mate with the female. And we could conceivably come across an intelligent being that was sort of like this. This would be bizarre to us that males would want to be being killed while they're mating, but it's still in terms of the basic forms of desire. They want to reproduce, they want to pass along their genes. We could understand that. But in terms of the genuine, radical, different psychology, people have asked me this. What if something is so different from us we couldn't recognize it? Well, if we can't recognize it, we can't recognize it. There's no psychology. So that can't happen. So my conclusion, there's a possibility of non-human persons. Our main question practically is about moral practice. <coughs> Expanded Turing test is probably the best we're ever going to have. And once we treat something as a person, we still have to pay attention to its interest. It might be different enough from us that we shouldn't treat it like us, even though it is enough like us to be a moral patient. Thank you. <laughs>